Good morning from New York. Uh, my name is Gabriel Budu, and this is the second installment of the Skates Art Industry Hangouts. Today we'll be talking about art fairs, and we're joined by three distinguished guests again from around the world. Um, with Alison Rodman joining us from New York, uh, the communications manager for the Armory Show. Uh, Christina Samastrelli, also in New York, uh, the fair director for the Affordable Art Fair. And from Vienna, Christina Steinbrecher, the artistic director for the Vienna Fair. So we're going to just have a conversation about um, art fairs today and tomorrow, uh, asking three broad questions. What is the ultimate role of the art fair? So kind of a more high level overview. Um, then, what are the most recent trends that you know fair managers and people involved in fairs are noticing in running an art fair? And then a look ahead at what you know the future of art fairs holds in store, um, and you know the development that might take place in, in that in that space. So I'll start off with uh, Alison. Um, what is the ultimate role of the art fair? Well, the ultimate role, I mean, it's hard to say what the ultimate role is, but there's certainly an emphasis on, you know, there's the auctions and then the art fairs, which enable galleries to come together and, you know, compete at the same market level because of the sheer force of them all banded together. In addition to that, there's also the, you know, element of there being, you know, all these gallerists coming together from all over the world to introduce potentially new material and creating a destination and a meeting point for international buyers in the world. Right, yeah. And I mean, you, you are involved with one of the world's biggest art fairs. Um, you know, the affordable art fair kind of operates in a slightly different market. Um, Christina, how would you describe that fair's role? So really, where we want to focus is we want to focus on kind of the democracy of art and for us it's kind of the educational aspect of the art fair and that we cater not only to the novice visitor and the well-seasoned art fair goer but at the same time we want to cater to the um, new exhibitors and so for us the focus is to to nurture new talent whether it's um, you know a gallery or the artist but at the same time we want to focus on bringing more people into the door and having art kind of uh, spread in the lifestyle kind of realm. Right, okay. and, um, and then you know going across the Atlantic there to Vienna um, Christina in terms of you know the Vienna Fair that's not too far away from Basel um, how, how does the, the Vienna Fair distinguish itself in, in this kind of framework of art fairs internationally? I think first, uh, I think the distinct role of an art fair is bringing actually demand and supply together and create demand and create supply or <clears throat> show the supply that there is there. And the role of Vienna Fair and the niche that Vienna Fair has taken very successfully is that we focus on Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe and really try to make an effort to show the best of the best what is there in terms of artists, in terms of institutions, in terms of collectors that are coming and joining and um, want to talk about what they do and how they do it and they want to share their knowledge with uh, collectors from the West. So basically the exchange of information that um, an art fair can present is um, the other role of an art fair is the exchange of information from supply and demand side. Right, okay, and then I'll just kind of open the conversation up a bit under this kind of role of the art fair banner. Um, how, how important is the, is the art fair as an educational venue and even as a curatorial venue? Ultimately it's such a, a commercial uh, endeavor, but to what extent is it also an important part of the institutional uh, structure of the art world? for discovering new art trends and, and movements and that sort of thing. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can speak... Oh, go ahead. oh, sorry. No, no, Christina, can, go ahead. I can speak for Vienna Fair because we have such a distinct niche. So we can say we have a lot of professionals coming by, curators, um, directors of museums that are really looking for and want to explore this niche we are in. And they're 
coming extra to see these galleries, extra to see these artists, and uh, they're ready to, f to find new things from that area because they don't have, they do the initial research at Vienna Fair and then they go out uh, into the region, you know, after they had their first contact. For affordable, it's very, very important. I mean, we even have a section on our website explaining to the new art fair goer how to buy art, how to start a collection, or even how to look at a piece of art to understand if, if you're really connecting with it. For us, it really means everything because we want to take away the kind of intimidating process that happens sometimes at art fairs or in art galleries and really show the 20 year old or the 30 year old or the 40 year old that's ready to start their collection um, that this is a wonderful learning kind of um, process and educational process that's going to um, carry you through the rest of your life. You know, for us at Affordable Art Fair, it's very important to constantly learn, and I think we want to translate that, and we do successfully to our exhibitors and then to the visitors. So for us, it's really you know part of our ethos. Well, intrinsic to it, right? Okay, Alison, communications manager, how do you communicate this kind of educational kind of slant? To this? Well, for us, I mean, it's certainly less directly oriented towards education. That's a priority of the fair. Of course, we have really high level programming, but the, the impetus towards education is sort of more about the idea of the fact that you will be experiencing the market exactly as it, the, the, the pulse of the market is what you can experience firsthand. And so, you know, while we certainly have a lot of programming, and, in, and this year in particular, we have a really strong um, series of panels curated by Ann Barlow, who's the director of art in general, with, you know, great curators and really serious, you know, luminaries. But at the same time, our emphasis is mostly on the fact that you can come here and experience exactly, you know, what the trends are in the market and sort of what the best of international contemporary and modern works are and what the sales sort of quotients are. Right, okay. Um, yeah, so that's that's a good kind of high level overview and then and then moving on to you know uh, the present day uh, specifically what if what are you noticing uh, as the most recent trends in in the business of running an art fair so not necessarily trends in art but actually in the business of running an art fair um, you know with, with a lot of this consolidation taking place um, between you know uh, the large affairs internationally falling under one umbrella, uh, that sort of thing. Um, are they turning into tourist destinations more than uh, art world destinations? Um, I'll, I'll start off with, with you, Christina, in Vienna. What have you noticed as recent trends in this respect? Well, we noticed a higher number of visitors that are not from the art world, definitely. And um, the question is how to cater to them so that we cater to our exhibitors and to the audience that is there um, that are professional that that collect that are collectors and so on and how do we cater um, equally or in, in a good respect in good terms to these new visitors and um, because it's a different sort of education that we have to provide it's a different sort of approach that we have to provide provide in terms of printed material in terms of online in online material and it's the wording has to be different than to the art world it's um, one of the challenges and the other is obviously online. Um, online is becoming um, well so dominant and so important that people want to get basically all information online before they want to be um, not necessarily fully informed but they want to be caught uh, with what you do online, what you, how you present yourself, what sort of information you give and how you position it and I think this is Another thing that we noticed that the demand for, for online representation and we tried to respond at last year with our blog that we launched um, to provide throughout the year uh, information and content about Vienna Fair. Right, okay. Yeah, the, the online question is an interesting one. We might return to that in a moment. Um, just continuing answering this question, Alison now, in, in terms of trend in, in the business of running an art fair for the Armory, what, what have you noticed in that sense? Well, I would say that it's gotten, we've tried to make it a more sort of boutique experience, so to speak, by s making it a smaller fair and making it seem less behemoth. And I think that that's sort of part of a larger trend of, um, you know, developing 
the fairgoers experience to be more sort of specialized and more relaxing as opposed to, you know, the armory has gotten a lot of criticism in the past as sort of being described as a glorified shopping mall. And I think one of the larger trends is to sort of try and move away from that and make a more sort of refined experience. And I would say that's a very large trend. Right, okay. Well, look forward to seeing that uh, <laughs> quite soon this year. Yes. And then, and then, Christina, the affordable art fair. So, um, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, we started with one fair in 99 and we have 18 fairs globally right now. And so our focus is to bring art to the city. Um, so in that, what we're seeing in our kind of demand is that we need to become part of the lifestyle. Um, with that trend, you know, we have to compete with what people would do on the weekend normally. And so with that focus, we have to attract someone to not only come for the art, but come for the experience, similar to the Armory, just on a different level, very much so, um, that it has to become an all-encompassing kind of day of fun or with a great restaurant or great food or great paneling at the same time. Um, so with that, we need to compete with what people like to do on their Saturdays and Sundays, just on a, on a basic level, since we're bringing it to different places. Right. And, and so what, you know, bait and hook mechanisms does the affordable art fair use then? What sort of marketing um, outreach do you do to, to, to get people over there uh, on the weekend? Right. So one of the things that we really like to do is um, the fall fair at the tunnel this past fall, we had mixology classes um, sponsored by Quantro. And so basically what we did is not only were you coming for an evening out to see art, but you were going to stay there for a, a, a little bit longer time and you and your friends or your, your partner could take this class and learn a little bit something. So more, you know, but this about mixology and alcohol in the backdrop of art and then, you know, just being in the art scene. So, um, again, it, it's, it's, it's attracting what people like to do on the weekend and bringing it to the fair. Um, you know, w with our families, it's very important to have children's programming so that um, this becomes a family event Saturday morning and Sunday morning. And so we always make sure that we have a children's workshop where perhaps the parents could go and look at the art by themselves and the, the children are, um, you know, being looked after. Um, but at the same time, learning about art or making art, or at the same time, we have family tours. So it's a family experience rather than uh, maybe going to the zoo in the morning. They're going to come to the fair and learn about art together as a family. Right, yeah, I think Freeze had a, had a bit of that kind of event-driven, uh, you know, it needed to really push that when it, when it uh, launched last year in New York, because, you know... Absolutely, it was, it's on an island. It was, it was mm -hmm. stuck on an island, so that, that they created an experience out of the whole boat, they, they added some nice restaurants and, and kind of drinking venues over there, so it was more like, you know, it was like, a, it was kind of in a kind of big circus tent, so it was almost like a day out. As much Absolutely. As and the outside area, the grounds that you could walk around, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it just all made it an encompassing experience where you spent the day. And that's, you know, the lifestyle kind of desiring attachment of people that we need. Right. And so, yeah, that, that physical, tactile kind of experience is great. Uh, Christina, you mentioned the, the, how dominant online is becoming. So, uh, you know, as, as the experience online becomes increasingly sophisticated and, you know, enjoyable for, for looking at art. Uh, is there a fear that this could really have a big impact on how many people visit art fairs in, in the future? You mean a negative impact or a positive yeah, impact? I would, say, I would say in terms of just, you know, traffic, in terms of the number of people actually going out of their way to, to see a fair. Um, well, I think more, a higher number would just mean that we have to change the infrastructure and how we deal in organizing the fair. I don't think it's a negative thing. I think it's a positive thing that more people are interested. I think many of them can also afford, so once they're interested, they can also become regular buyers, if not collectors. I think it's just a positive impact. It's just a matter to learn what you do with these crowds, how you distinguish between the buyer and the collector, and what you propose to them and how you deal with uh, with your space and with the infrastructure around it. So I think it's it's a positive thing, but we just have, all of us have to learn what to do with it. And I think people have right now different keys to it, you know, so it's just about trying it out. I don't think anyone has like the perfect solution right now, what to do with online, how to actually 
bring, so we have some numbers, so if we look at what VIP Art Fair uh, presented and what sort of numbers they got uh, once they launched, um, it was quite impressive of the, of the people that came and, and the, the diversification where they came from. I think, you know, these are numbers that are exciting and I think they will be growing over the years. It's just a matter of how, how you track them actually then physically to your side and if you actually need to do it and how you propose, like how can an art fair propose um, products online to a buyer without competing with a gallery. I think this is all in the making but it, no one really has the right key to it. Yeah, I think it's an excellent tool that we just have to learn exactly what you said, Christina. It's something that we find really wonderful is that we're able to support our um, exhibitors year round. You know, when they have an opening, we post it on our social media sites and, you know, on our website, we have more, you know, we started this blog part. So it, it, it's a way to uh, keep in touch with our exhibitors, keep in touch with our visitors year round. That's something that we can just really, really utilize. And you know, if they want to come, if they want to have the experience, they're going to come because it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be in the center of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and for us, I mean, we certainly use it as a support tool to continue to network and feel connected to our exhibitors. But we're also this year for the first time partnering up with Artsy, and we'll have a preview of the fair online February 27th, which is about two weeks before it begins. And so, you know, to go back to the point of the experience as sort of, or not the experience, but, you know, these terms of the way the internet will affect the brick and mortar fair as being undefined. I'm very curious to see how that will change sales. And I'm very curious to see what it will mean for people to have access to the works and to know what's at the fair prior to the doors opening. Right, yes, that, that, that would be very interesting to see with yeah. the beautiful, you know, work that Artsy does on its site. Um, I will, will, now move on to you know this kind of look ahead that um, that I said we would do. So you know going forward, um, and I think we've we've just touched on this now with with questions of online and and you know that sort of thing. But um, going forward, and Alison, actually, this might have some interesting relevance given you know there's now two big fairs in New York, and, yeah. and that, is that going to become a kind of a status quo? And then you know going forward, what do you see as the development of you know your fair and then fairs in general, um, how would you like to, you know, kind of look at that? Well, in terms of being in New York and there being two fairs, I think that two major fairs, I mean, New York is a very big city with a lot of international buying power in it. And I also believe very much that Freeze and the Armory respond to different points in the market and different needs within the market. The Armory sort of picks up on a lull between the auctions and sort of the low season in art buying in March, whereas the Armory, uh, whereas, excuse me, Freeze responds to, you know, the auctions at that time quite directly. So I think that there, we're responding to very different things. And, you know, while we attract a lot of the same clientele and a lot of the same buyers, it's still, there's, there's certainly more room. There's tons of room. Existing in New York, there are God knows how many fairs. And I think that proliferation of fairs, to a certain extent, is the future. I think that that will stop, and I'm not sure when, but right now, as the market is quite strong, I think they will continue to build and proliferate and address different niches within the market. Right, okay. So, so you don't see any consolidation on the cards in the style of, you know, Art Hong Kong and, and Art Basel, the MCA kind of, MCA um, kind of takeover and that sort of thing. You see, you see them as siloed entities addressing, you know, different markets, essentially slightly different spots in the same market? Well, honestly, I don't know. Um, I think that I, there certainly could be a move towards consolidation, but it doesn't seem imminent. It doesn't seem as though that would be something that, you know, would happen within the next five years. Right, okay. At least in New York. At least in New York, okay. Um, and then Christina in Vienna, um, how do you see, you know, the Vienna Fed position? Um, well, we are now going to continue and work on that niche. We are extending further to the east. Basically, we will we included already the um, Emirates. We working um, largely with Turkey, so we're going further east. 
and we want to be this meeting point between East and West. And we try to further define it, narrow it down, and bring the, the most interesting of East and West. And I think we have still, um, well, it's still a big field, you know, for us to work. Since we're not competing, we are not, um, we are not competing with either Fries or Armory. We just have a very distinct niche, and there's still a lot to be done, you know, and it's working on the educational level as in the first time buyers and uh, educating at all collectors, you know, because there's a lot of potential people with a lot of yeah, potential just to start buying or to start collecting, you know, you have to educate them, you have to bring them somewhere, you know, you have to get them interested and people are getting largely interested due to internet, due to whatever, you know, to the also increase of the art market. So we have still quite a bit to do. So this is, uh, this is what I see, but I also see, um, I mean, I think there's uh, only that many big art fairs as in, in, in the scale and size of, um, of either Freeze or, um, that, or Armory that can happen around uh, the world because they're, busy, they're targeting a certain area or a certain continent, but I think there are only that many that the market at this price range can actually supply. So I'm, I'm quite curious to see what's going to happen in the next, I mean, I don't see the five year term. I'm, I see it actually more eminent. I see it more, maybe more at a two to three year scale. I'm quite excited what will happen. Right. Yeah, that's, that, it, it is an exciting time for that sort of thing. It's ever evolving. Um, and then Christina from the Affordable Art Fair, how do you see the Affordable Art Fair's role going forward? Well, if there's the demand, we will supply it. And I think that's basically the, the be-all, end-all here. If there's the ability to have 22 fairs down in Miami, I think there was 22 satellite fairs this past year, they're going to do it. You know, um, New York City in 2007 was a lot different than New York City in 2009 with the amount of um, art fairs that were going on. It has very much to do with the economy and what – um, the demand is for the art or niche art fairs, um, you know, very specific fairs, or even for the big fairs and who's going to go. Um, so for affordable, you know, if the city wants the art, we're going to bring the art to the city and keep on going. And so far it's, you know, in um, 13 years, 12, 13 years, we have 18 fairs globally. So um, as long as there is the demand, we're certainly there to supply it. That's great to hear. Well, three wonderful fairs represented this morning, and I want to thank you all for, for joining us here. Um, it's been a pleasure, and I'm going to say goodbye and, and uh, join us again next time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. Bye.